light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining jesus light of the world shine upon us set us free by the truth you now bring us shine on me shine on. finally be strong in the lord and in strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Paul, as he writes to the church at Ephesus, I think it's more or less a form letter for us uh, to look at. And he tells us to be prepared. That as we get ready to live this life, we know that we don't wrestle with things that are flesh and blood. That we wrestle against things that are beyond that. We deal with the flesh, yes. We have to struggle with the flesh, yes. But the things that cause our fleshly problems... Their force is much greater than just physical things. I, 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 when I go to fight for my faith, I'm not having to arm wrestle somebody about it. I'm not having to take my lust or my anger or my frustration and put it on this table and have a go at it, just me and it together, fighting it out. That it's something that's a lot harder to do because it's not a physical thing. But we deal with it in physical ways. We've been looking for a, a good while now about these, this battle that's going on in our minds, in our hearts. The flesh over the spirit. And we've looked at these works of the flesh and we've, we've broken some of them down, a good number of them down. And we've looked at the, the sexual sins and we've looked at the sins of, of temperament and we've looked at, at other sins. And the last one we looked at was last week of these, these fits of anger, this, the sin of these of anger, this, this rage sometimes that we have. And we looked at the problems that anger causes and how we can be angry and say not, but still, if we're involved in those types of things, that anger develops into something much greater, some strife and some, some, some more problems that are listed in those works of the flesh. So as we take these works, we're pulling these works out of our life, battling the flesh, trying to get rid of them out of our life, and we're balancing that out with these fruits of the Spirit. Putting these pieces of the Spirit. Ingesting these fruits within our life. That may be why Paul calls them the fruit of the Spirit. Is that we, we need to be injecting them in our lives. We need to, to take them in. And just to feed on them and use them in our lives. So that we, able, we will be able to appease, control these works of the flesh. Ideally, we would look at kindness tonight. That would be the one that we would look at, would be dealing with kindness and trying to put kindness as this fruit of the Spirit in our life. But when we looked this morning, I thought it would be <laughs> killing you with kindness, I guess, of talking about kindness this morning in the lesson and then kindness again tonight. So I thought maybe we would overlook that since we got the kind words in this morning from Romans chapter 12 and look at the next one. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. Goodness. How do you define goodness? How do you define something that's good? You know? Because good is one of those words that we use like love, isn't it? We use, you know, I love my wife, I love my children. It's two different loves. I love bacon. That's a totally different love. We use the word loosely where in the Greek there are different levels of that love. Different uses of a, of a different word to describe the different feelings of love. We use good the same way. Right? You're a good person. God is good. And I think you can see already that that doesn't balance out as the same thing. If, if they do, then you could say, if God is good and I am good, therefore God good, I'm good, therefore I must be God. And that doesn't play out at all. So we know that we use that differently. 
We say this team is a good team. And then they may just get obliterated by another team. Can they be good and still be defeated? Well, we look at that, yeah, because we have different levels of good. It's one of those words we just throw around loosely. This, that's a good thing. This is a good thing. This is a better thing than that. But good is something that we just throw out all the time. So how can we define goodness? Better yet, how, how, what, how do we see goodness? Once we know what it is. And then how can we put it into our life? That's the, that's the, the journey we're going to take as quickly as we can in this evening. So let's define goodness. If in your Bibles at uh, the very beginning of the Bible, if you look in Genesis chapter 1, you can, we see the word there. Uh, in Hebrew, we, we see it mentioned after our Father is there and the Son is there and the Spirit moves over the face of the waters. God says, let there be light and there was light and we know all about all these things that God created on each day. And after he created them, we notice there's a phrase that is used. On one of them, look at verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 4. And God saw that the light was good. You can look in verse Eight. We won't look at all of these. Well, not verse eight. Um, uh, uh, lay, verse ten. And God made the dry. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together, He called sea. And God saw that it was good. Later on in verse twelve, after making each bearing fruit seed after its kind, God saw that it was good. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night. And God saw that it was good. God making everything that creeps on the earth. He looked at it and says it was good. God makes man. He says it's good. So when we look at how God uses it at the very beginning of creation. And what that word means there. If God is creating these things and he's saying they're good. Goodness mean, must mean something that pleases God. Goodness must mean something that is pleasing to God. So if we want to parlay that into us today. Goodness is going to be something or someone that pleases God. So that's our first definition. It's for us to be good. For us to be to practice this fruit of goodness. We need to do things that are pleasing to God. We need to be doing things so that when God looks at our life and he sees us doing some deed, he sees us involved in something that he looks at us and he watches us and he gets the same feeling he did when he created the world and he steps back and says, now that, that's good. Just as he did at creation. That's asking a lot though, isn't it? It's asking a whole lot for us to be able to do something that was pleasing to God on the same level as creation. Well, that's one definition, one way to look at it. Same when we, we say in our little prayers, little kids say in their prayers, God is great, God is good. So we can define God as good. Something that is pleasing to God, something that is like God. Because God is good. We even say when we say goodbye, what are we implying? We're saying as you, as I leave you, as I go off throughout your day, or as we, till we meet again sometime, I'm saying bye to you in a good way. Now be good. That's what that really means. Be good as you go out. I read about a preacher one time who said, I'll do the best I can because that's what I'm paid to do. I'm paid to be good. Because you guys, you, you're good for nothing. You, you're good for nothing, but I'm paid to be good. <laughs> you like that? Uh, that will hit there again later. So when we look at this, God is good. Goodness is like God. Goodness is being pleasing to God. But it's even more than that. 
And the last definition that I want us to hit is being good is simply doing the right thing for the right reason. Because when God created the world, He did it for the right reason to create an environment where we could express and to share love. And He looked at it and He said that was good. That was the right thing to do for the right reason of what He wanted to do. So if we're going to live lives like that, if that's the way we're going to live, we need to practice doing the right thing for the right reason. Because a lot of things you can do good, but you can be doing it for the wrong reasons, can't you? What about these Pharisees? They're doing a lot of good things, aren't they? They're, they're tithing equally. They're making sure they're doing all of the things exactly the way they're supposed to. They're doing all of the good works. But God makes it clear that the reasons why they're doing them, that's, that does away with the good deed in itself. If you're doing it for selfish reasons. So we're going to define goodness as we go throughout the rest of the lesson. Is goodness is going to be doing the right thing for the right reason. And as, we are, as we've done with other things, let's look at the example that Jesus sets forth, and sets forth and how he does it. So look in your Bibles in Luke chapter 4, in the reading that, that uh, Colton did just a few moments ago. And we have the temptation of Jesus here. There's a demonstration of what Jesus did, of doing good and doing it for the right reason. He's tempted with three different sins here. The, the first one, are three different temptations. The first one, the devil comes to him and he, he tempts him with selfishness. He comes to him and he says, you've been fasting, you haven't eaten for 40 days, you got to be hungry. So no, if, why don't you, if you are the Son of God, why don't you look at these stones and why don't you just command these stones to be bread? Now, would it have been anything wrong for Jesus to make a rock into bread. Did he have that power? Absolutely he had that power. Would it have been wrong for him to do that without the devil saying anything to him about it? Well, let's think about it. On the surface, we look at it and say, no, he could, he could do that. But his purpose was to be fasting. His purpose was to be focusing on something other than himself. And for him to do that was going to be selfish. For him to do that, the devil says, listen, don't, don't look at all this world. Don't look at what you're focusing on. Why don't you look at yourself? And Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus does what's right, and he does it for the right reason. Jesus says, I'm not going to eat this, I'm not going to make this rock bread. Number one, because it would be wrong for me to be do, doing something selfish for myself. Number two, it would be wrong for me to be giving in to a command that you've asked me, or you're, you're giving to me. You're requesting this of me. It might be good for me to make that rock bread, but for me to not make that rock bread would be doing what's right for the right reason. The second time he gets it compromise. He want, the devil wants him to compromise. Look at what happens in the next temptation. The devil took him, verse 5, up and showed him all the kings of the world in a moment of time. He said to him, To you I will give all this authority and all this glory, for it has been delivered unto me, and I will give it to whomever I will. If you then worship me, it will be yours. So here, Jesus, you can go off and go to the cross and you can go do your thing at the cross. It's going to be painful and it's going to be hurtful and it's, it's going to be good and you're going to be doing it for that reason. I understand the devil says, but listen, why don't you just compromise a little bit? Why don't, instead of taking the whole world, why don't you just take right here what I'm going to give you? I'll give all this to you and you don't have to do anything. Let's just compromise. Let's have agreement. You're coming to this world and you want everybody I'm, I want everybody, tell you what, I'll give you some if you just fall down and give me you. Just compromise. Now, it would have been easy for Christ to do that, to give in. But there again, when he said no, when he said no, I'm, I'm not going to do that, and he quotes Scripture, Jesus is doing that good, and he's doing it for the right reason. 
The reason being, I'm not going to do this because you want me to. There's something greater beyond the purpose of my calling. See, for us to live our lives as Christians, there's something beyond. If we didn't learn anything from this morning's lesson, we, sh we should have learned that. Is our calling is much greater than, than anything else this world has to offer. That we have a calling, a goal, something set up, a standard to live by that we have to be living towards. And as we live our life, we need to be doing good and doing it for the right reason. Not selfishly. Not to compromise. Doing it for the right reason. The final one that we see here. The final temptation that he gets him is this for to be popular or to have all of them these people come to him, these angels to worship him. He took him to Jerusalem, set him up on the pinnacle of the temple, and told him, You are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will guard, he will command the angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. See, it would have been very easy. These three things that we've mentioned, it would have been very easy for Jesus to give in to those things. But he knew that if he endured, that was being good and doing it for the right reason. He could have given in and maybe went out and tried to find another way. But he did what he was supposed to do. Reasons why God had put him there. Now, in the same way, church... To parlor that into our lives for us. We're tempted the same way the devil tempted Jesus. We're tempted in the same different avenues. We're tempted to compromise. We're tempted to have the love of mankind and humanity. And, and to have all of these things for us. We're tempted to be selfish. And all of these things. And it's easy for us to sometimes be good. To do good things. And we can, we can throw that blanket statement. This is a good thing that I'm doing. But deep down inside, we know that when we do it, we're doing it for reasons other than the right reasons. We're doing it for us. We're doing it for us. For ourselves. Because we have some sort of ulterior motive. We have something else in mind that we can gain from it. That's not true goodness. That's hypocriticalness. That is what the world views when they see the church. They see the church as a group of people who do good and they do it for themselves to make themselves look good. We have a calling to be different. Goodness is doing the right thing and making sure we do it for the right reason. So how can we do this? There's some tangible ways. Look at Matthew 7, 17. We're just going to do a few of these and then we'll quit. Matthew 7, 17. When Jesus writes this, or Jesus says this as Matthew pins it in the Sermon on the Mount. Every healthy tree bears good fruit. Every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the dis diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. What kind of fruit are we producing? We need to look at what kind of fruit that we're producing for the world to see. So the first tangible thing that we can do, that the world can see we're different, is forgive. In the chapter before on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that if you're not willing to forgive others... Don't expect me to forgive you. That's pretty hard sometimes for us to forgive people. But we know that it's the right thing to do. We want to hold on to grudges. We want to hold on to things and, 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 and use them later, don't we? Not only do we want to hold on to them, we want to pull them up and use them again. You've done me wrong and I'll get you back. And I may not get you back, but I'm, and I may say that I forgive you, but I'm going to pull this up later at a later date, years later. And now you're going to remember this day because of the evil that you've done to me and the wrong that you've caused upon me. It's hard for us to forgive. It's hard for us to do that. That's one way we can be doing some good things. We can practice goodness and be doing it for the right reason. It's just simply to forgive. The second one that we can do is we can be pure. Being pure. Because the world says that we don't have to be. Listen to this. This, you remember Gary Hart? 
I'd forgotten about Gary Hart. A lot of the younger people, they won't remember Gary Hart. Gary Hart was a man that ran for president. And as he ran for president, he got caught. It was found out that he was involved in an extramarital affair. He'd had an affair. And he had to withdraw from the presidential race because it was common to everyone else. There's no way he's going to be elected because he cheated on his wife. You remember that? He pulled out of the race because everybody said, there's no way, there's no way you will ever be able to win the election because of the affair you had. This is what he said recently. Our nation has matured. And now we freely elect candidates who have had extramarital affairs. Being different. Being pure, doing good, doing it for the right reason. Dolly Pardon said, marital faithfulness is okay as long as no one gets hurt. Raquel Welch, men have sexual flings and it's okay. Just expect it. That's what the world says. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what God asks us to do. If you're going to be a good person... You got to be a pure person. You got to put pureness in your life. You got to make sure you're doing the right kind of things for the right reason. That's what's good. That's what's good. It's to be pure. Be forgiving, to be pure, and to be gracious. Number three, gracious. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, we read that we are a new creature. And being that new creature, we know that God has changed us. He's taken us into what we were and as we were baptized into that watery grave we came up and we had Christ living in our lives we were changed we were new there was something different about us we are to now live lives that are gracious towards others because of the grace that was shown to us that's what true goodness is being gracious to others we may have performed some good acts but we need to make sure we're saying the right kinds of things to people for the right reasons. To shower them with that love. Finally, we need to express our goodness through our generosity. One last verse. If you'll turn to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, and we're going to look at verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. We take lives. The, Lord, the world looked at Jesus, they didn't focus on Him. They didn't look at him. And all he did in his life, that all he did was give. You ever thought about that? You ever, do you remember one time in the whole ministry of Jesus? Here's one time that I remember in the whole ministry of Jesus where Jesus just allowed something to be done for him. Where he took something. And that was when Mary anointed his feet in John chapter 12. When she anointed his feet with that spike nard and, and dried it with with her hair and let the fragrance go throughout. When, when, John, when, when Judas is to sell it and give it to the poor, Jesus says, let her alone. Because you've always got the poor with you, you don't have me with you always. And I always wondered why that was there. I had trouble with that passage because it looks so Jesus is saying, just yeah, let her pour it all over my feet. But no, Jesus wasn't saying just, just rub on my feet, Mary. You, I deserve this. I'm good enough. I need you to do this for me. That's not what Jesus is doing. The whole time through Jesus' ministry, even in that, it's hard for us to see, but he's giving. He's, he's generous. He's healing people that don't deserve it. He's taking away the sins of people that don't deserve it. He's giving food to the poor. Giving food to people that don't deserve it. And even in the situation with Mary, 
He's allowing Mary to do this. He's giving to her. Does he really want all that on his feet? Did it feel good? It must have. But he wasn't doing it for selfish reasons. He was doing it for her reasons. Doing it the right thing for the right reason. For her, not for himself. The whole ministry of Jesus was all about giving. The world didn't know him. The world didn't like it. Sometimes the world don't know us. But that's what we need to be doing. Giving as well. Being generous with our lives. Not just with our money, with our time, with all of these things that we got. Those are just some simple things. Some very practical lessons of how we can practice true goodness. Because goodness is doing what's right. But it's making sure that when you do what's right, it's doing it for the right reasons. And that ultimate reason is to give God glory in all things. Forgiving one another. Living a pure life. Showering people with graciousness because that's what we received in that grace. And being generous towards others. So tonight as we close out this lesson, you look at your life. And as we go throughout our, our life, we, most of us would say we, we're pretty good people. We're pretty good. But we know that all of our righteous deeds, all of our good deeds, they end up like a big pile of filthy rags, Scripture says. They, doesn't, they don't really equal out to anything really good at all. So let's, maybe you need to look at them in your life and just see how good you really are. What have you been doing and how you've been doing it and you've been doing it for that right reason? And if you have, here's your chance to fix it with your life. Here's your chance to come back home and ask for forgiveness and allow that sin to be taken away again and start off fresh. If you're not a Christian tonight, it, you, you've, you've been experiencing this graciousness, this love from God this whole time. You just didn't realize it. And He spared you. That gracious enough, He spared your life tonight. He's given you this opportunity tonight to come and to fix your life. And do what's right and do it for the right reason. Goodness is not going to get us into heaven. Works aren't going to get us into heaven. But doing the right thing for the right reason... Now that will. That will. Because it's not doing it for us. True goodness is allowing Jesus to live in our lives. And every good that we do, it's not coming from us at all. It's coming from Him. So you think about your life, and if there's things amiss that you need to fix, fix them as we stand and sing the invitation song.